Thank you for tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast from the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdill, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's January 2020, and you're listening to Episode 157, which is a discussion about reincarnation and channeling. On this episode, I'm joined by Dr. Doug Groteis, who is Professor of Philosophy at Denver Seminary and the author of Christian Apologetics and also Unmasking the New Age. Doug has written two online exclusive articles for our website, Equip.org, and Doug's articles are called The Reincarnation of Reincarnation and Channeling, Revelations of Deception. You could read both of them for free online at our website, Equip.org. Doug, it's good to have you on. Thank you. Happy to be back, Melanie. Well, it seems like the New Age has never gone away, really. Your book, Unmasking the New Age, is from 30 years ago. So why are you writing on New Age subjects again? Well, these issues just keep coming up. They actually come up throughout human history. After the fall, people will seek God in the wrong ways, or they will, I should say, seek spiritual experiences or revelations apart from what God has revealed in the Bible and through Jesus. So I gave it my best shot, really, with my first several books, which were about the New Age movement. They came out in the mid-80s to early 90s. And uh, darn it, the thing just won't go away. So we've got to keep working on it. And I can't assume that people will remember what I wrote. Or I'm older now. I'm 63 just about. So I've got to remember there are a lot of younger people that don't know these arguments about reincarnation and channeling. So I need to give those all over again to try to equip the church to stand for the truth and to defend the gospel. Well, I think those topics have kind of come back around and just really have been accepted just culturally. And a lot of it has been the influence, I would say, of like yoga and then people using that as a springboard to get into other things. And so reincarnation is kind of like a hip thing, really. And it was funny. I get some, as I'm sure everybody does, marketing emails. And I was just so surprised at just, you know, I got this marketing email about how to de-stress your life by saying these various mantras to Ganesh, which is a Hindu god. And I just thought this is supposed to be like uh, a marketing email from some company selling stuff. And it's really weird. I mean, it's just, just straight up a lot of new age and Eastern kind of concepts. And so reincarnation is all part of that. And they kind of try to weave it into their lifestyle email. So it's just a lot of people are being subjected to these kinds of different beliefs that they may not have been familiar with or because everybody, you know, thinks it's hip to be involved in some of these or believe in reincarnation and those kinds of things. It's just become so naturally part of like spirituality in our culture. So I'd like to ask you specifically, why don't you tell us what is the teaching of reincarnation and karma? Because a lot of people drop that word karma a lot too. Oh, it's karma coming back to somebody. What are those two concepts? Yes, they're very closely related. And this comes out of the ancient religion of India more than anywhere else. And it's the idea that we're not limited to one life, that people have lived before, they will live again. You have some kind of a soul or some kind of a spiritual aspect that is embodied over and over again. And in Hinduism, this is not limited to human beings. It applies to all of life. So an animal could become a human, a human could become an animal. Now, what is in charge of reincarnation, that's where karma comes in. Uh, Karma means a kind of law that assigns rewards and punishments according to what you have done in your various lifetimes. Now, it's interesting to me, having been writing on cults and new religious movements and world religions now for about 40 years, to see the word karma everywhere. 
Uh, you can see videos online called Instant Karma, which is actually uh, not a concept in Hinduism because karma obtains from lifetime to lifetime. But people say instant karma, meaning someone did something very mean or, or terrible, and then they immediately get into a car accident. So it's this idea of judgment. But in the Eastern systems, typically uh, the judgment of karma affects reincarnation without there being a personal God to administer the karma or to even evaluate persons with respect to their moral deeds and what kind of moral outcomes should occur. So this appeals to people because, first of all, we are spiritual beings. We're more than material. So we know that the uh, space-time material world is not all that there is. We, we know that at some level. And we have a yearning for life to go on and for life to be better after this life is over, after we die. Plus, everyone has a sense of justice or a sense of right and wrong. We see that in Romans 2, 14 and 15, that the work of the law is written on the heart, whether or not people have access to the Bible. So people deny the biblical view that God is holy and just. He's a personal being distinct from the world, and he will be in charge of the last judgment that there is no reincarnation. It's appointed to everyone to die once and then comes judgment. Uh, that's Hebrews 9.27. People will move in this other direction. In fact, just recently, one of my graduates at Denver Seminary said that he has a neighbor who in some ways is drawn to Jesus, but he just can't give up the belief in reincarnation. And at least he knows that Christianity and reincarnation are incompatible belief systems. Some people try to fuse them or amalgamate them. I know a couple of years ago, there was this Hollywood movie that came out that was really popular called A Dog's Life. And it was about, you know, the beloved family pet who died and then they found another dog that they felt was reincarnated, their old pet. And so this idea of reincarnation, I mean, a lot of people... I probably feel like hope, like I lost, like you said, it's not just a, applying to people, like I lost my beloved pet and it going to, you know, rescue another pet. You see a pet and you think, oh, I look in their eyes and it looks like my dog. Maybe my dog's reincarnated into this other dog. So why do you think people believe in reincarnation? Well, that's part of it. They want to be assured that this world is not meaningless, that uh, love keeps going. And I saw that film that you just mentioned, and I felt so torn because I'm a ridiculous dog lover. So I cried throughout the whole movie, but then I'm also a countercult expert and I can't endorse reincarnation for anybody or anything. So I got out my frustrations by writing a blog post about it, I guess, or a Facebook post. But we tend to be sentimental. And if we don't have the right worldview, we'll try to fulfill that desire for meaning and value with a worldview that really doesn't make a lot of sense uh, because we have such strong evidence for the truth of Christianity in terms of the uh, historical reliability of the New Testament and the uniqueness and finality of Jesus through his life, death, and resurrection and the wisdom we find in scripture for daily life and the wisdom on how to rightly relate ourselves to eternity. But Sadly, a lot of people have not heard the gospel, or if they've heard it, they have never heard it defended through rational argumentation. So this belief in reincarnation, karma, and so on, is just in the air. In fact, you were mentioning this idea of uh, meditating or praying to Ganesh. My wife Kathleen came back from Costco yesterday, and I looked at one of the boxes, and it showed someone in the yoga position. And it just had to do with de-stressing. So historically, uh, worldviewishly, if you will, yoga, reincarnation, and karma go together. And they're found originally in Hinduism. So I was saying the New Age is everywhere 30 years ago. Uh, now it seems to have permeated even more than it, than it had. So Christians really need to have a reason for the hope that is within them. 
and realized you can't blend and fuse the gospel of God's good news in Jesus, of forgiveness through the death of Christ, with any idea of karma or reincarnation. Jesus was resurrected from the dead, and he's the first fruits of what is to come, the resurrection of all humanity. He was not reincarnated. He had not lived in a human body previous to his advent. Uh, So Jesus and the gospel are radically incompatible with and at odds with this idea of reincarnation and karma, certainly. Well, I know there's people out there that think the Bible teaches reincarnation. And how does scripture differ from this belief in reincarnation? Because some people would say, well, we're going to die, and but then there's going to be the resurrection, and we're going to have new bodies, and our souls are not going to be the same fallen soul. So how is that not reincarnation? Right. Well, resurrection is the idea that we are given one mortal physical body. We're a body and a soul, an interactive dualism, if you want to use uh, the philosophical term. And then at death, unless uh, we're here when the Lord comes again, our soul separates from our body And we are in a spiritual realm, either with the Lord in his presence or awaiting judgment, the final judgment. And then at some point there will be a resurrection of the just and the unjust, to use the language of Daniel 12, verse 2. And that's where it ends. So if you fast forward to Revelation 21 and 22, you find that there's a new heavens and the new earth in which there are no tears, no death, no curse. But there are those who are outside this reality, those that have not repented, those that have not come to Christ in humility to receive eternal life. So the idea of resurrection is very different than reincarnation. What they have in common, obviously, is that there is life after physical death. But biblically, There is, as I said, a two-stage process of disembodiment and then resurrection, and that's it. And in reincarnation, there is uh, disembodiment, re-embodiment, disembodiment, re-embodiment. And the goal of reincarnation is not to have a more comfortable or happy next life. If you go back to Hinduism, and also this is in Buddhism, the goal is to leave this world behind entirely. So you don't have to come back anymore. You essentially evaporate into nirvana such that the world is completely left behind. And this is not fellowship with God. This is not the enjoyment of a renewed and purged creation. That's a biblical vision. This is basically the annihilation of everything human and everything regarding personhood. So they're two absolutely different visions of of this life and the next life. Now, there are those out there that teach New Age beliefs that posit that the early church did believe in reincarnation. It was in the Bible when the Bible was first put together, but there was a time during the early church that various fathers decided to take reincarnation out of the Bible. So was reincarnation originally taught in the Bible and then taken out of the Bible by the early church fathers? No, this is a popular idea. And I deal with this in a chapter called Reincarnation and the Bible in my book, Confronting the New Age. As far as I can trace it, this idea probably goes back to some teachings of the early church father Origen, who lived from 184 to 253, but Origen did not believe in reincarnation. Uh, He believed that the soul pre-existed the body, but he did not believe that there were various incarnations after our death. He believed in a final resurrection. And moreover, uh, he didn't purport to write a gospel, a story about Jesus Christ. He was a theologian, and he was helpful and good on some things, on other things, He was off base, and biblically, there's no case that we exist before we are physical beings. We come into being at conception. Uh, We're made in the image and likeness of God. 
and we will continue to exist forever in one of two places. So I have read this so many times, and it's almost taken to be common knowledge that the Bible used to teach it, but then somehow it was taken out. Now, also, if you look at it in terms of New Testament documents, uh, we have about 6,000 complete or partial Greek uh, manuscripts of the New Testament documents, and none of them teach anything like reincarnation, and that includes the earliest ones. So the idea that somehow the early church had the power, or there were some power-hungry clerics that went around and snatched up all the manuscripts that taught reincarnation and took it out is terribly implausible. There's just no good argument for it. In that sense, it's similar to the Muslim claim that the original writings about Jesus didn't say he was God and didn't teach the Trinity and didn't teach the gospel. Well, there's just no credible historical scenario for how any person or any group of people could somehow expunge these documents of things that are so essential. So it's just not true. You're listening to the Postmodern Realities podcast from the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest is Dr. Doug Rotheis, and he is talking about two of his articles that you can read for free online at our website, equip.org. He's written two online exclusive feature articles for the Christian Research Journal. The first one is The Reincarnation of Reincarnation, and the second feature article is channeling revelations of deception. We'd like to invite you to subscribe to the Christian Research Journal. A subscription is $33.50. And to subscribe, please visit our website, equip.org. In addition, another way you can help us out if a subscription is not in your budget at the moment is to share this episode on your social media accounts or email it to a friend. And you can also rate and review this podcast Wherever you get your podcasts or at Apple Podcasts, search for Postmodern Realities Podcast. We'd love it if you would give us a short written review or at least a starred review so that the more reviews that we have, the easier it is for people to find our content. The other way in which you can partner with us for a small amount is to tip us for our content. And you can do that by going to our website, equip.org. Go to our front page, see the magazine section, click down on that drop down menu hit Postmodern Realities Podcast, you will find a landing page for this episode or any of your favorite episodes. And you can see that there's a link there where you could give us a tip. A tip could be $3, $5, or $10, which would probably be the cost of eating a lunch out or your favorite coffee drink. And maybe you want to forgo that for one day this week and give us a tip to help keep all of our content coming to you for free. And the best way you can help us spread the word is just tell a friend. Send your friend a copy of this episode, a link to it, and let them know about this podcast that they might be interested in. And we thank you for your partnership. We are talking about reincarnation and just this idea of, you know, if you don't do things well in this life, that you can try better in another life. And maybe if you don't do well in that life, you will have the opportunity to do again in another life. And just, I guess, for all time. But what does the Bible say about the afterlife and salvation? Because the Bible does say that our souls will go on for eternity, that we won't cease to exist. It's not like this physical life that we know now is all there is. And then we die and then we cease to exist in terms of our souls and even our bodies. So what is the Bible's view of salvation and the afterlife? Well, we have to really go back to the beginning to Genesis, and there we see in chapters 1, 2, and 3 that God created human beings in his image and likeness to have dominion over creation, to cultivate it, to live in harmonious relationships. But our first parents turned on God. They listened to a lie and were expelled from that garden. So sin entered the world. You see this in Genesis 3 and all throughout scripture. So there's something wrong with the human being and everything we touch is corrupted in one way or another, but God never 
gave up on the human race. He continued to reveal himself in what he had made in creation. You see that in Genesis, or rather, yeah, Genesis 1 and also Romans 1. And he sent prophets, and the prophets spoke of a coming one, a Messiah. Messiah comes in the person of Jesus, and he lives the life we could not have lived, a perfect righteous life. He dies to atone for our sins. He's buried, and he rises again from the dead as the Lord of life and ascends to heaven, where he now is and where he awaits us to turn from our selfish ways, turn from our rebellion against God, and to submit to him, to receive forgiveness and everlasting life. And that forgiveness involves what's called justification, which means that God does not hold our sin against us. He has set us right through what he has done. He has given us Christ's righteousness, and Jesus took the penalty for our sin. We repent of our sin, and we turn to him, and we're told that we, at the point of conversion, receive eternal life. So life that does not end, life that is stronger than death. So the final state is not a disembodied one in heaven with Jesus and the saints. That's temporary. The final state is a restoration of the full person and the full creation. So Paul speaks of this in 1 Corinthians 15 about the resurrection of the body. And just as Christ was raised in space-time history at a point in time, sometime in the future, those that trust Christ will similarly gain a resurrected body. But there's nothing to do with karma here. There's no self-effort that contributes to our being forgiven or justified or receiving eternal life. It's entirely a gift. And that's what grace means. There's no grace in karma and reincarnation whatsoever. Uh, Let me give you an example of how reincarnation and karma is is popular in our culture and how we can respond to it. I was in Boulder a couple years ago and went to a restaurant and had a nice meal and I found out they didn't take credit cards. So I said, I'm sorry, I don't have any cash and I don't have uh, a check. And they said, well, we'll give you our karma envelope. And I said, what's that? said, that's an envelope where you will pay us back later. And the idea is, if you do pay us back later, that's good karma. And if you end up not paying us back and stealing a meal, that's bad karma. So as soon as he said, he didn't know who he was talking to. So as soon as he said, I'll give you the karma envelope, I said, I don't believe in karma, but I will pay you back. So I went home and I wrote an evangelistic letter and put it in the envelope with my payment. And I focused on Jesus, and I said what I just told you, basically, that I don't believe in karma because I believe in Christ, and Christ is the Savior. He is my Lord, so I don't fear death, and I don't fear the final judgment because, uh, you know, as the old song says, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. So I want to ask you, are there ways, can you tell us some of the logical problems there are with reincarnation and how can that help equip us like you were in that restaurant with the envelope there? How can it equip us to respond to people who believe in reincarnation? Yeah, there are a lot of problems. And I wrote an article on this for the Christian Research Journal a few years ago on the logical and biblical problems with reincarnation. One of the greatest problems is that in most systems of Eastern thought, karma operates automatically and impersonally. So it's not that there's a God who assesses karma and then assigns rewards and punishments from lifetime to lifetime. It's just a process, like a natural law. But if you think about it, if you're going to evaluate moral situations, you need an evaluator. And if you're going to reward or punish people for their karma from lifetime to lifetime, you need to have an administer, an administrator. And if karma is just impersonal, and if God is uh, an impersonal and amoral force principle vibration, then you basically don't have the workings to make karma happen. It just doesn't make sense. And then you have another problem on the level of the individual 
And there are two versions of this in Buddhism. There is no soul. There is no individual substantial existence. You're just a collection of states. So you never had a soul. And when you die, what seems to be a soul, if you're unenlightened, just breaks apart. And there's no unified enduring self that goes from lifetime to lifetime. So if there isn't a self available, then there can't be anything that karma attaches to. So that's a huge problem in Buddhism. And then in non-dualistic forms of Hinduism, it's the opposite situation. The claim is that there are no individuals, but that's because there is a cosmic or universal self, which is called Brahman. All is one, all is God, and we are God. But in that situation, there are no individuals either. There's just one uh, indefinable, impersonal something that is called Brahman. So you have some very deep philosophical problems, let alone the incompatibility with scripture. And the scriptural understanding is logical. It's based on historical evidence. It gives meaning. It also helps fulfill our deepest human yearnings and longings for restored relationships. We can have peace with God through Jesus Christ. And then that peace works in our lives, works out into the world. And as Schaefer said, we can find substantial healing in our relationships with our friends, our family, with creation, and so on. And remember, the final goal in all forms of reincarnation, all classic forms, going back to Hinduism and Buddhism, is the annihilation of the person. It's not the fulfillment of human yearnings. It's the annulment of personality itself into some kind of faceless, indescribable nothing. So different than the abundant life that Christ came to give us. Well, the other article that you wrote for us for our website is called Channeling Revelations of Deception. So what is channeling? Why is this new age concept making a comeback? I think people sense that they need some kind of authoritative word about life. And this should have a spiritual source, a transcendent source. So people want some kind of communication from a higher level. Now, what we have in the Bible is God's revelation through Scripture. He inspired the different authors to write what he wanted them to write, but this in no way bypasses their personality. They don't somehow go into a mystical trance and then wake up and find that they they wrote the Gospel of Luke or something like this. But in channeling, the idea is that a person will become a vehicle or a channel or a medium for an entity, a higher entity, who then communicates information about the afterlife or information about loved ones who have passed on. And what I found in my study over the years is that whether we're talking about the old mediumship of the 19th century in the U.S. or Edgar Cayce or the Ramtha teachings from, what, 30, 40 years ago, none of these teachings affirm the good news of a gospel as found in the Bible. They all contradict the gospel. I think that's quite telling. So scripture warns us about counterfeit angels, counterfeit gospels, counterfeit Christs, and this is exactly the message you find in these supposed channeled events or channeled documents. So are there other reasons why people are interested in channeling? I mean, do they want to maybe hear from departed loved ones? Yes, that's the reason for a lot of it. Uh, You think of going back in the 19th century, the Fox sisters and the idea that they could be vehicles to find out what people were doing in the afterlife, or if there even was an afterlife. But then I found out in the 70s and 80s, especially, that the channeling was widening 
its scope of topics more in terms of the great philosophical questions about the nature of God, the nature of humanity, salvation, the afterlife. And the message that comes through the channeling is always a basic New Age perspective on things. Uh, the idea that we are all somehow divine and that we can tap into this divinity through various means of meditation and yoga and visualization and so on. The channel teachings usually affirm karma and reincarnation. So if you don't have a firm hope in the things of God as revealed in scripture, then if you believe there is an afterlife, you want to know something about it. You And I want to be sensitive here because uh, I, I lost my first wife last year and I would like to talk to her. You know, I would like to see her again. Uh, I'm remarried. I'm very happy and it's terrific. It's a gift from God. But people are naturally lonely for their loved ones. But as a follower of Christ, I know exactly where Rebecca Merrill Groteis is. She's in the presence of God with all the saints. Uh, she's no longer tormented by dementia. And uh, we grieve, as Paul says, but we don't grieve as people without hope. So I have hope, and it's a rational certainty that I will be with Rebecca one day. So I don't have to go to a channel or go to a medium to see, well, what is she thinking right now? And what is it like up there? No, I commit that to the Lord because I have enough information to know where she is and that she's far better off now and that she will one day be resurrected with a, a glorious body uh, like unto the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what does channeling teach about God and Jesus and salvation? Well, it distorts it for one thing. It always distorts it. But typically, it would be pantheistic that God is not a being distinct and apart from us who created the world, but God is a universal principle or presence, that we are a part of this universal reality, and that Jesus was one of many gurus or masters or swamis or avatars. They might say that he channeled material from a higher level as well, but they will deny his uniqueness as the one and only Son of God. They'll deny his saving work on the cross to atone for our sins and set us free from the devil. So maybe the best way of viewing it is what do these teachings deny? Uh, they'll affirm various things, but they always deny the most important thing there is to affirm, and that is the crucified and resurrected and ascended Jesus Christ. Because Paul says that there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And Jesus himself said that he was the way and the truth and the life and that no one could come to the Father except through him. So we have a sufficient mediator. We have the one who has made God known to us and who has offered the love of grace and grace of God to us. So there's no need uh, to go to a medium, a channeler, a mystic. In fact, that will only deceive people. And the truth is found in Christ. And we have the great record of that in Holy Scripture. So what about those who would say that the Bible itself is a product of being channeled? Yeah, that's a category confusion. Now, you could put channeling and biblical inspiration in the category of revelation, but channelers, for one thing, as I mentioned, contradict what the Bible says. So channeling and the Bible can't be from the same source because truth doesn't contradict itself. And God doesn't contradict himself. He doesn't speak out of both sides of his mouth. But channeling has to do with people leaving their normal consciousness and somehow becoming vehicles or becoming mediums for 
information from a higher realm. Now, scripture involves so many different types of literature, but when we talk about God inspiring a writer of scripture, uh, this can involve literary and historical investigation, like you see in Luke 1, 1 through 4, where Luke says to Theophilus that he has studied the matter very diligently and carefully, and he is reporting the truth about Jesus. So the reader of the gospel can have certainty about the matters of Christ and the gospel. And you might say, well, how does divine inspiration work there? Well, obviously, Luke is not going into a trance. He's not suspending his abilities as a rational thinker and as a historian. God is employing that. God is using that. And even if you look at the book of Revelation, where John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and he's given visions, he's still a coherent narrator. So uh, what he says relates to history. This was John the apostle, the one who was so close to Jesus. So the whole idea of how revelation comes to us from God is very different when you consider the inspiration of Holy Scripture and the supposed uh, information or revelation that is coming through these channelers. And I should say that there are so many on offer. I mean, you've got someone like uh, the German philosopher Rudolf Steiner, who called himself a clairvoyant, who was quite a philosopher and quite an intellectual, but he claimed to get information about Jesus from what he called the Akashic Records, sort of the celestial hard drive. You could just tap into it and gain knowledge that is not otherwise possible. Well, you know, lo and behold, what Rudolf Steiner says about Jesus that he supposedly got from the Akashic Records contradicts what the New Testament says about him. And what are you going to trust? The New Testament, which is historically verified in a coherent testimony of multiple authors and which fulfills the great promises and yearnings of the prophets in the Old Testament and the people of Israel, or are you going to trust a German philosopher who goes into a trance and tells you otherwise? I think the answer to that's pretty straightforward. So when people are employing the practice of channeling and they're you know, being taken over by a spirit from beyond, do you think that those spirits are demons? I mean, is there a demonic aspect at all to channeling? I don't think so. I have three basic categories for channeling. One is people can simply fake it. They're claiming to receive knowledge from this higher spiritual realm, and they're making it up for some reason or another. Another category would be that people are somehow mentally ill. They have some kind of dissociative disorder. So part of their consciousness is speaking. They think it's an entirely different entity, but in fact, it isn't. What's happening is a result of a mental illness. But then thirdly, there is the category that you mentioned, and that is demonic possession. We know from scripture, particularly in the life of Jesus, that demons can control people or have various dimensions of influence over human beings, even over animals. There's an account where demons went into a herd of pigs. So there are immaterial, finite spiritual beings who are malevolent, which scripture calls fallen angels or demons, who can affect and influence people such that they claim they're getting knowledge from a higher dimension. So scripture does talk about doctrines of demons. And whether a person is directly demonized supernaturally or whether they're just making stuff up, as long as what they say contradicts the gospel, then it is a false gospel, and it is, one way or another, a doctrine of demons. So does the Bible teach about channeling at all? Does it have anything to say about it? Well, it does, because it speaks of mediumship. If you go to Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 14, you have a long list of occult activities, all of which are forbidden. And I remember Walter Martin used to say it's the longest list of forbidden spiritual activities in Scripture. And that speaks of contacting the dead, uh, necromancy, which means basically the same thing 
And it says, stay away from that. These practices are forbidden. And there's no need for it because we have the revelation of God in Scripture. And Christians have the Holy Spirit, who's the spirit of truth, who will guide us into what is right. So Scripture warns about counterfeit gospels and counterfeit doctrines, counterfeit Christs, counterfeit angels. So we have to always emphasize what is true and then make that the standard by which to test these other supposed revelations. And of course you have in the Old Testament the whole problem of false prophets, prophets who say this says the Lord, but they're just speaking out of their own flesh or they're speaking perhaps through some kind of demonic influence. So scripture is very aware and warns us frequently about false messages. And uh, some of those would fit the category of what we today call channeling. Well, what would the Bible's alternative to channeling be? Right. The alternative is the truth from God as it has been revealed in scripture. And then the truth of God incarnate in Jesus Christ, who is the one mediator and who is our sufficient and adequate Savior and Lord. So the person who is rightly related to Jesus by having faith in his work and who wants to follow him has everything he or she needs for a spiritual life. There's no need to go hankering after new revelations or new information about Jesus. We have the four Gospels. We have the rest of the New Testament. We have the whole Bible. We have the Holy Spirit working through biblical churches. Uh, We're part of the kingdom of God. And Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, and we belong to a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So we need to seek truth and apply it to our lives. We need to call out to God for renewal of ourselves and our churches and our country. We need revival very desperately. And revival, which always points back to Christ and glorifies Christ, is the ultimate alternative to false spirituality. We need to condemn or we need to evaluate what is wrong and challenge people to turn away from false doctrines and channeled experiences and channeled material, but we also need to offer something uh, eternally better, who is Christ himself and his gospel. So you mentioned earlier that you were writing books about the new age back in the 80s and early 90s, so 30 years ago. So do you think you'll keep writing on the new age in light of the current spiritual climate? Well, it looks like I will. I've been asked to do some writing. In fact, recently I wrote a chapter on the New Age movement for a book that's coming out. I try to respond to what the needs of the time are. And it seems to me that uh, the New Age movement has not only not gone away, it's gotten more pervasive. It comes into our everyday vocabulary with how we use words like karma and guru and I want to be a truth teller, and simply because I've responded to something before doesn't mean there's not more to be said. I think the basic ideas are the same as what I dealt with 30 years ago. The basic arguments responding are essentially the same. There may be some new twists, some new turns on how it's presented, but as long as the gospel's being challenged and false gospels are being propagated, then I would like to do what I can to refute those and to be an advocate for the truth of Scripture and of the living Jesus Christ. And I think you're right. The younger generation, you mentioned that you're in your 60s, and I think generations that are millennials or Gen Z, younger than that, some of these words are just like pop lingo for them, karma and so forth. So they're probably not familiar, at least Christian kids aren't familiar with the fact that the Bible doesn't teach channeling or reincarnation. Well, finally, I want to end with some fun rapid fire questions for Doug. So Doug, it's January. Do you ever make New Year's resolutions? No. (laughs) 
Okay. Are you highly scheduled and organized or are you more a go with the flow person? Uh, more go with the flow. Name something that's on your bucket list. I would like to go to Northern Italy with my new wife, Kathleen. And name a book that you read in 2019 that you think everyone should read. It doesn't necessarily have to be a Christian book, but a book that made an impression on you last year. Yes, it's a book by Os Guinness called Carpe Diem Redeemed. Well, thanks, Doug, for being a guest on the Postmodern Realities Podcast. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to the Postmodern Realities Podcast from the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest has been Dr. Doug Rothheis, a longtime writer for the Christian Research Journal, who has written two online exclusive feature articles for the Christian Research Journal that you can read free of charge at our website, equip.org. The first article he's written is The Reincarnation of Reincarnation. And the second article that he has written is Channeling Revelations of Deception. Please go to our website to read either of Doug's articles. And we thank you for your partnership. We'd like to hear from you, so connect with us on social media, like the Bible Answer Man Facebook page, and follow CRI, Christian Research Journal, Hank Hanegraaff, and the Bible Answer Man on Twitter. And please subscribe to the Bible Answer Man channel on YouTube. If you like this episode, please subscribe to the Postmodern Realities Podcast on iTunes, and please rate and review our podcast. When you rate and review our podcast, it helps others see our content. And please share this episode on your social media accounts. Be sure you tune in daily to the Bible Answer Man broadcast hosted by CRI President Hank Hanegraaff, who answers your questions live on air. To ask Hank a question, call 888-ASK-HANK, Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. In addition, head to iTunes and subscribe to Hank Unplugged, Hank's audio podcast. Follow Hank Off the Grid, where he has in-depth conversations with some of the brightest minds discussing topics you care about. So until our next Christian Research Journal author conversation, thanks for listening to the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Mm-hmm.